everyone, I hope you're back from the break. Uh, Jerry Ellsworth is an inventor. She's the CEO and co-founder of Tilt5, and she's also our next keynote speaker. Everyone, please welcome Jerry. Wow, it's such a joy to be here. Yeah, I've used uh, Linux and Unix uh, most of my professional career, and uh, I'm, I'm proud to say now I, uh, on my primary work machine now, I have a KDE install and loving it. I don't know why it took me so long to uh, move over to you guys. So I have a lot of slides to go through and not much time. Um, it's going to be a little bit of a rambly story, but um, I hope the, the key points that you'll pull out of this is um, look for mentors along the way, because my life has been drastically improved um, because of mentors and people that have helped me along the way. So my background's pretty interesting. Um, I grew up in rural Oregon. Uh, I was raised by my father, who um, raised me by himself. He uh, had a, a pretty lucrative professional career um, when I was born, but unfortunately my mother passed away the first year um, after I was born. And he had to give all of that up and move to this little farm out in Oregon to be closer to my grandmother. Um, he tells stories of you know how agonizing it was when he'd have to go off on business trips. He'd give me to the the babysitters, and I would cry and wail. And he'd come back five, seven days later, and I bonded with the uh, the sitters. And then I'd cry and wail, like who's the stranger to to pick pick picking me up? And so he made some huge sacrifices um, to to raise me, and I really appreciate that. And in fact, he's my first and probably most important mentor in my life. So uh, as a kid, um, I was super curious. I didn't like uh, not understanding how things worked. And at a, a super young age, probably, I guess, like five or six, old enough to sneak into my dad's workshop and get screwdrivers and pliers and stuff like that, I started taking apart all of my toys. Um, this was very frustrating for my father uh, because, you know, toys are expensive and I was just dismantling them, but I just had this innate curiosity, like, you know, why does this thing blink and make noises? I had to know. And that kind of curiosity has stuck with me my entire life. Um, to kind of stave off destroying all my toys, I specifically remember there was a time when my father who at this point had sold everything, moved to Oregon, and has had been working as an auto mechanic, a kind of low paying job um, auto mechanic, um, brought home a box of automotive light bulbs and some batteries and some duct tape and some wires. And he showed me how to use tape to stick to batteries and to light up light bulbs. Um, and this was really amazing. I had so much fun with this, but, you know, of course, as a curious kid, the first thing that you do is, like, here's a light bulb, here's a different light bulb. So I took my gooseneck lamp, tipped it backwards, and screwed the light bulb, and took one of the uh, automotive light bulbs and dropped it inside. And as you could imagine, you know, I fell backwards, there were showers of sparks everywhere, the circuit breakers in the house blew, I was scared. I didn't want to uh, reveal it to my father, but I couldn't hide it for him for, from him very long. Uh, eventually, he figured out that you know half the power in the house was blown out, and he gave me a bit of a scolding, you know, and turned it into a learning lesson, you know, about the dangers of electricity. You know, batteries are one thing, but playing around with 110 volts is another thing. Uh, but, you know, my, my desire to take things apart, you know, wasn't staved off with just a, a rack of automotive light bulbs. I just had to know how everything worked. And so I continued to take everything around me apart, and including, and I should probably tell my father about this someday, I, I took apart some of his stuff and actually, you know, broke it. And uh, at this point, I don't know, I was probably six or seven, my father had done a really bold move. He had 
given up his job as an auto mechanic, he'd scraped together enough money that he could buy or lease a gas station and repair shop across town. And uh, uh, it was an interesting time for me because I remember we were struggling a lot at that point. There wasn't a lot of money and we lived off of a lot of the food and the, uh, the meat that we raised on his little amateur farm. Um, but that was, it was a really magical time to watch him go through that struggle. And, and he was very candid and shared it with me. But one of the things that he did that sticks with me today and was such an amazing thing is he couldn't necessarily buy a lot of toys from me to take apart, but he did put a box out in front of his gas station with a sign on it that said, bring your broken electronics and put them in here. And every like three or four weeks or so, I'd get a random box full of broken electronics that I could just take apart and play with. And it was the best toy ever, right? I, I didn't know anything about what was going on inside, but I was taking these things apart. I would bend the little components back and forth and break the leads off, and I was making little piles of resistors with no wires on them and capacitors with no wires and uh, so much fun. I mean, of course, there were some uh, negative things that happened too. I remember one time I took apart a tape deck and uh, there's this thing called a capstan. It's on this big metal circular thing and it's like a nail sticking up and it was sitting on the uh, floor of my bedroom and my dad walked in with his bare feet and stepped on it. Um, he was not happy about that. So, you know, there was a, another lesson to be learned there about you know, clean up your, your room uh, and don't hurt me. Um, never lets me forgive that. I forget that even today. Uh, so I got a little more advanced. I started learning more about electronics, playing with light bulbs, and all these like components are soldered into these circuit boards and I wanted to get them out. And so I discovered that I could take a uh, AC wall transformer and hook it to a power transistor and it would get really, really hot. And when it would get really, really hot, it would melt the solder that holds the uh, components in. Of course, I was far too young to have a soldering iron. I was seven or eight years old at this point, probably. And so I was secretly doing this in my uh, bedroom when my father wasn't around. And it worked quite well. It was kind of smelly, so I had to be careful. Uh, one day I was trying to do this and uh, my father walked in and he was not pleased at all. And so he's like, you know, I'll teach you how to use a soldering iron and, you know, stop doing this. Let's teach you how to do it safely. So at a very young age, my father was open to letting me use potentially dangerous you know, equipment, and he got me a soldering iron and showed me how to use it. And that was, that was amazing. Um, the number of hours that I sat just pulling components out with a soldering iron, you know, it's, it's staggering. So at this kind of young age, it was probably around, I don't know, maybe 1983 or 84, somewhere in that time range, uh, we went to visit one of my the friends of the family and they had a TI-99 4A computer and I had been seeing computers on movies for you know years and years and I was just enamored with them these magical devices that could do anything and so I begged our friends to let me play with the computer and I spent probably two hours just typing on the keyboard things like you know, I didn't, I didn't know how to program, so I'd just type like, draw house, and it would say, syntax error. Hmm, paint house, syntax error. But that didn't stop me. I was just having a great time doing things with this computer on an old black and white television. You know, eventually, you know, we went back to the friend's house a few times, and they brought out the programming book for it and said, like, this is how you, you use it. And one of my most fond memories of using a computer was the first time I entered several hundred lines of code and made um, what 
T.I. called it Mr. Bojangles dance on the screen. He was this little block character that would just dance and his, his uh, hands would move up and down. I was completely hooked at that point. So I started a full court press on my father to get me a computer. And back in those days, you know, there weren't really computer stores around you could go to. You'd go to the big box stores. And living out in the middle of nowhere, I was nine miles away from the closest town. And we didn't have a big box store, so it was probably like an hour, you know, to get into one of the bigger towns. I was constantly begging my dad, like, let's go to Montgomery Wards or let's go to Sears so I can look at the computers. And occasionally, you know, we would be making a trip and he would make a special stop by the computer and electronics section. And back in those days, the uh, store displays were really primitive. They didn't have any kind of software running to demonstrate them. They were just a line of computers. So there was Ataris and Apples and, and uh, VIC-20s and, and, and they were just set up at, sitting at basic prompts. So, you know, I, at this point I knew how to type things like 10, print, hello, go to 10. And I'd be like, dad, dad, come look. I'll, I'll write a program for you. And uh, it was super fun. I know that he was struggling. He was trying to get his business off the ground. He couldn't really afford to do this. Um, but I just, I really wanted one and he was, he, he made it happen. And it was funny as I wanted a VIC-20 because back in the day, there was the VIC-20 and Commodore 64. The VIC-20 had really big characters on the screen. So the letters were really big. It was 22 columns versus 40 columns, the super high resolution display of the C64. But that's what drew me in was it was the one with the biggest characters. But fortunately for me, um, he got me the Commodore 64. And the Commodore 64 was an amazing machine, and many of you have probably used those um, if you're a child of the 80s. Um, but uh, I think it was really interesting the way that he purchased this. He purchased it and hid it in his bedroom in the closet. And I caught him one time. He didn't realize that I'd caught him, but he had, he had been unpacking it from the package and hooking it up to his television in his bedroom and trying to learn how to use it before giving it to me. So, you know, I'm living with my father alone and I'm riding the bus going to school. So a lot of times I'd come home, you know, he had to work until six or seven o'clock at night at his service station. So I had like three hours by myself. So for probably a full month, I would sneak in and I would take the, uh, the computer out and the disk drive out and I'd hook it together and I'd start playing with it. And at the time, we only had one diskette for it. And uh, I didn't know how to format the disks or do anything with them. And it had some demo software on it. And uh, it had like a few blocks free of storage. And I wrote a couple programs and filled the disk up, you know, before I even got a chance to, uh, to that it was revealed to me. So eventually, my father gave it to me. No special occasion. It was pretty, pretty amazing. I pretended that I was. Uh, surprised and and uh, we set it up in a common area and uh, I started playing with it a bunch so he did go and buy me one video game cartridge Donkey Kong um, I must have been talking about it he went out and got it for me and it was amazing to have a video game that I could play because we had no other software for it so but that didn't satisfy me forever I was, again, a curious kid. I, it didn't take me long to like open the top of the Commodore and peek inside. And then also, I didn't have really a good concept of how electronics or EEPROM storage worked. So I figured that this cartridge was just making electrical connections. So I should be able to make the same electrical connections by sticking knives and forks into the cartridge slot. And so, I, I did that. I would stick a, a knife into the or fork into the cartridge slot and the screen would just wig out and there'd be all these colorful things happening on the screen. And I was just sure if I poked it in the right way, a video game would pop up. And uh, so I ended up burning up two or three Commodore 64s and he had to send them off for repair or exchange. I, you know, they're probably under warranty at this kind of early stage. I probably was I helped the demise of Commodore back in the day. But um, 
I remember the day he came back uh, after I'd broken it, and he's like, yeah, those Commodore 64s are junk. They're not reliable. So the guy at the store gave me this Commodore Plus 4. Uh-oh. Wah, wah. You know, those of you that know Commodore, the Plus 4 was not really a great gaming machine. But um, that was OK. Uh, I wasn't necessarily into games as much as I was into programming. And this particular computer had an advanced version of BASIC with graphics routines and things that you could do with simple commands versus the Commodore 64, which was a lot closer to the metal. So this was my computer for many years. I was very, very happy with it. I learned a lot on it. So probably one of the pivotal mo moments for me is my father bought me this electronics playground as a, uh, a gift. And this is where there was a big transition for me from not understanding electronics to starting to learn electronics. I'm probably nine or 10 at this point, And these electronic kits were amazing. They had a bunch of wires and a booklet with cute little cartoons. And they told you how to hook these things together. And you could make police sirens, or you could make an AM crystal set radio, or you can make the seven segment um, play like a, a dice game. And, I just endless hours of fun and learning with this. It was such a great investment in my future. And because I got into this, I met a boy. Oh, no, actually, I should, I should tell this story first. So at this point, I'm starting to learn a little bit about electronics. And uh, I have a stepbrother. He didn't come around much. He was kind of far away. And occasionally, he would show up. He was much older than I was. Um, I, we didn't have the best relationship for various reasons, um, probably because he was older and then I was always kind of probably taken care of a lot more by my father during these visits. But I started to discover with uh, like three, three little components, a transformer, a relay, and a nine volt battery, I could make an improvised taser. And so I wired this thing together and I could generate a little taser device that would uh, administer mild uh, shocks. And so, you know, my brother's giving me a hard time. One day I run off, I grab my taser and I zap him with it, which he promptly ripped out of my hands and then started torturing me with it. So, you know, it's like, okay, if I'm gonna do this again, I need to like come up with a, a better plan. So my plan was, you know, I'm gonna hold on to the nine volt battery. So if he tries to rip it out of my hands, I'll have the battery and I can get away. And so I, some other visit, he comes by, and I'm going to go tase him. And uh, I shock him, and he grabs the transformer, rips it out of the hand, and it's success. I have the battery in my hand, and so he starts chasing after me, and I'm running away. And he takes this heavy transformer and throws it and hits me in the middle of the back. So, you know, lesson learned, you know, just don't tase people. Uh, it's just not a good idea, um, even if you can disable the taser. Also because of that electronics kit, I got into to radios quite a bit because um, they had a project where you could make a little transmitter. And also in the junk bin at some point uh, that my father was bringing home, I got a shortwave radio. And uh, this was really an amazing device for me, the shortwave radio in particular, because it could pick up foreign broadcasts. And it was this strange world of you know foreign broadcasts and you would hear Morse code and all kinds of interesting things and it would fade in and out at different times of the day and I was just obsessed listening to it. I think for me, being a kid living by myself nine miles out of town with like no nearby friends, it, 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 was, it made me feel a little bit less lonely, you know, knowing that there was like this big world out there. It was super fascinating. And uh, so, also got into building these transmitters. And I, I met a, a boy on the bus who was just a couple years older than me. And he was also into electronics and also had one of these electronic kits. And he was also interested in transmitting. And so we started building little pirate radio stations. And we would start, we would meet up and we would count the number of phone poles from his house that we could hear the radio station on our little transistor radio on the AM band. 
And then we'd ride from my house and we'd count phone poles. And that's how we would compare each other's transmitter. And it was kind of this war between us. Like one day he would like optimize his and, you know, he could go a little further. And then I would build one a little bit more powerful. And, you know, we were all, we were doing this with like scrounged up parts. You know, eventually, you know, we moved from using little small transistors to we started finding uh, old tube radios at, you know, in garbage cans and stuff are sitting alongside the road. And we started building bigger and bigger transmitters. And um, at some point we had built transmitters so powerful that we'd ride for most of the afternoon. We couldn't reach the end of our transmit range. And uh, that was when we switched to from the AM broadcast band to the FM broadcast band. And we started having you know, it's a little more difficult to broadcast on FM and it doesn't go as far. And we did the same thing. It was super delightful. I had a trick though. Uh, you know, if, if Mike ever sees this, uh, I, uh, my bedroom was on the bottom floor of the house near where the phone lines came in. And I found if I could wrap like 10 wraps of wires around the phone lines, I could get extra distance. And I think he never understood why every time we would kind of go under a phone pole, the, uh, my signal would get louder. Um, I'd say, you know, I didn't know what a mentor was at this time, but even though Mike uh, was just, you know, near near an age, he was very much a mentor. He's a little bit more skilled than I was. And uh, I started to learn this kind of, you know, if you can be excited with your mentor about what you're doing, um, they'll give you lots of help in exchange. And uh, that's that's worked for me and helped me throughout my career and my entire life. So around this time, I was just so hungry for information about electronics. I'd go to our old Carnegie um, library, which was really small, and it had like three books on electronics, and I read them cover to cover like 20 times, and they were probably books from like the 1940s, really far out of date. But um, I looked onto a couple gentlemen that came there. Uh, they were ham radio operators. And I got to know them. They were very old compared to me. I, I probably hadn't interacted with anyone that old before. Uh, but I, I got over my creeped out factor of talking to old dudes. And, uh, and we started talking about electronics. And I, I found that they were a fantastic resource for me. And uh, they invited me over to their homes. And one of them had like this shed outside back of their house and the inside of the shed looked like this, full of electronic gear and radio equipment. And this is, this is like dream for me, all of this equipment and the ability to do things. And here is another set of mentors that came into my life that uh, really helped accelerate my, my skills. And uh, in fact, those, uh, those folks, I, I wish they were still alive today. I would go to them and thank them profusely for what they did. But they started giving me really junky old equipment. You know, they gave me an oscilloscope. They gave me voltmeters. They gave me books. And this was so critical being like 11, 12 years old to have this information. And um, it, it helped me start doing projects that were more advanced. I started interfacing things to my computers, like making sound digitizers. I started making amplifiers for my pirate radios, which they hated. They're always offended by that. But I think they also kind of were, were happy that I was interested in, in radios. But that was great. Um, it, it, it helped so much. Uh, about this time, I think I was 12, 13 or so, um, my father, he's like, you need to start working in the family business. So after school, I'd ride my bike over to my dad's gas station. And in Oregon, uh, you can't pump your own gas into your car, so you have to pump gas. So first thing I started to do is pumping gas into uh, you know people's cars as they came up, learned how to like make change and do all those kinds of things. And it was quite amusing. I'm like a 12 year old and like, uh, how much gas would you want? And they're like, are you old enough to do this? And in most cases, no. But since you're a, a family member, you can do like sketchy stuff like <laughs> pump gasoline. Uh, but he also uh, 
Mamie do everything around the gas station. Like he would service um, vehicles, changing oil, uh, swapping out cylinder heads, lapping valves, uh, you know, honing cylinders. And he had me doing all of that stuff. And it was such a great experience. I learned so much. You know, at the time, I maybe was a little grumbly that I had to go work every day after school instead of going home and playing with my computers. Um, but it, it turned out to, that I, I learned so many skills. Uh, and it was also hilarious, too. Like, we had a hoist that would lift the cars up. And uh, I was so short that, you know, to drain the oil out of a car, I had to lower it way down just to get to the, the plug. And sometimes I couldn't get the plug loose or the filter off. And my dad would have to, like, you know, try to almost crawl on his hands and knees to get under there to help me. Uh, but uh, this did one thing for me that was awesome. And, oh, sorry, I'm ahead of myself. Uh, around the same time, um, I really got into phone freaking. You know, back when there were landlines and people weren't rock walking around with uh, uh, cell phones, uh, we had these things plugged into the wall. And it, you had to pay money to call long distance and do things like that. And I was forbidden to use the phone because my dad feared that I'd run up the phone bill. So somewhere along the way, I acquired a broken telephone, fixed it, ran wires like sneakily alongside the house, kind of buried in the dirt to reach the phone connection. And I took the bells out of the phone and uh, had my own little phone. And in fact, actually, the first phone that I ever had was one that I made out of that electronics kit. And I used the Morse code key to um, dial. So for the, those of you that have ever seen a rotary dial phone, when you dial a number, it's actually pulsing, it's making and breaking connections on the phone line. And you can actually do the same thing with a Morse code key. So I'd call my friends up on my electronics kit. And I, I hated my friends that had a zero or a nine in their, uh, their phone number because you had to do nine or 10 pulses to do it. But at this time also, um, I started learning about phone systems and I was super curious about them. I learned a bunch of different things that you could do. I had my friends convinced that I had complete control over the uh, phone systems. I made some circuits that would pick the phone up so fast if they tried to call me that um, it would immediately pick up before the ring tone was on their side. And uh, I hooked it up to a tape recorder where I could play back messages like, this phone number has been disconnected. And so I'd prank call them and they'd call me back and I'd be like, you know, you call, call me back, I'll just disconnect my phone line. I can just do this because I'm so smart. Um, and also, during this time, I guess this is what I was getting at earlier, is so working at my dad's gas station gave me money so I could get more stuff. And so I worked, you know, one summer and got a Commodore 128, which was amazing. And I worked two full summers, um, plus after school and got an Amiga computer. So much fun. Uh, I learned so much. It's kind of funny is after I got the Amiga, it was such a complicated computer, I ended up probably using my Commodore 128 more. Uh, this is also the time that I got into bulletin board systems. I convinced my father I would be responsible with a phone, and I got a modem. And what an amazing time. Like, pre-internet days, you could go online, you could get games and stuff. A lot of them bootleg, you know, pirate. But, but you could also go online to multi-phone uh, multi line bulletin boards and play games with people through doors or have uh, chat. And... Um, I did that for quite a few years. Now that I think back about it, like how sketchy that really was. I mean, there were times as soon as when I got my car that um, I would meet up with people of all ages um, for meetups. And, you know, today you would never do that. But back then, I guess a, a simpler and more naive time. Uh, I mean, so, all right, I'm a weird kid, right? I uh, am into science of all types. I uh, when I was a kid, I built model rockets and launched them all the time. And I ended up burning like two acres of grass because I launched a model rocket and it set a big fire. And um, the other kids around school couldn't relate to who I was. And so around junior high and high school, I started getting picked on a lot, like really bad, uh, emotionally tortured and physically tortured, they would spit on me, they would write on my clothes, they'd shove me around, and they just abused me because I was an easy target. And I was, I was a sensitive kid. I was, you know, they could make me cry easily. 
and so this went on and on and on and it, it into high school and I think it was my um, sophomore year I had just like had enough one day there was this bully kid he tripped me when I was walking in the front of the class I was carrying this like big thick it was probably a math book or something I can't remember now but a thick one and I just lost it I just snapped internally and I just started clobbering him like you would like you would throw a discus I just start smacking him across the head with this and he flipped out of his chair and I was just going ballistic on him and our school and un unfortunately you know I wasn't smart enough to like start beating this kid up um, not in front of teachers and we had this zero tolerance policy there so you know I, I just remember the teacher grabbed me by my arm and drug me down the hall my feet probably didn't touch the floor you know two or three times as I went down to the principal's office and got uh, suspended for like four or five days you know I was pretty distraught about it you know my my father he was pretty understanding. He knew I was being picked on. He often told me, he'd give me pep talks. Um, he'd say things like, hey, you know, you're tougher than them. You're, you're mentally tougher than them. You know, if they pick on you, it doesn't really matter. You know, just think of it this way. This is actually something that I remember today. And I, I think of this today when people like give me a hard time, like online. Uh, he's like, you're stronger. You're mentally stronger than them. So if they're picking on you, it doesn't matter. And if they're picking on you, they're leaving somebody else alone, right? But that wasn't the case, you know, when you're like 15 or 16 years old. Suspended, I come back and then all of a sudden there's this new respect for me in, in particular with the bad kids. And, you know, I'm intelligent. So I'm like, hey, you know, if I hang out with the bad kids and they respect me, then the bully jocks and and the, the mean kids will leave me alone. And so I started going down this really, really uh, uh, angsty teenager path. I was the bad kid. And I, I, my grades like started slipping. I started failing grades, getting held back, um, getting in trouble. It was very common for me to get hauled home by the police late at night because I was out past curfew. You know, I was, I. I, I didn't feel good about myself um, and I actually channeled that into some unhealthy behavior like I was always like the one like hey let's climb this barbed wire fence and like go into this restricted area I don't care like pfft. yeah and so that was much of my teen years and I was always looking for an edge that made me kind of a little bit more edgy you know I went through different phases like kind of a goth phase things like that I'm still working with my father at the gas station and he's super concerned about me. He's giving me a hard time. He's like, you know, he's trying to give me some of the tough love stuff that wasn't particularly helpful, saying things like, you keep this up, you're going to be face down dead in a ditch someday. And he's, you know, maybe he's right, but, you know, lots of yelling and screaming and like a, a, a divide between me and my father growing at this point. And, um, but I was always looking for something really crazy and edgy. And, and I remember briefly my father had done some kind of hobby uh, racing on a dirt track. And I thought that was really cool. And at this point I had a car and uh, some of my friends and I would go out to the local racetrack that was pretty close and we'd watch this quarter mile dirt track racing. And in the upper left hand corner, that's what this looks like. These really fast cars like sliding around really close to each other. Um, that picture is not a picture of my me out there. All the other pictures of, are of me. But uh, so I came back after watching a couple of these and I'm like, dad, I'm going to build or I want to race cars, build me a race car. And he's like, no way. There's no way I'm doing that. You know, it's too dangerous. He's trying to like protect me. And I'm like, no, I got to do this. I got to do this. I'm just so into it. And I'm pestering him. build me a car, build me a car. And finally, after months and months, he's, he's like, I'm not going to build you a car. But if you can figure out a way to buy one or build one yourself, that's the only way you're going to do this. I'm like, all right, I really want to do this. And so I started to scheme, come up with a scheme to do this. I'm like, well, I'm not going to be able to afford to buy one. I've, these things are thousands and thousands of dollars. So I'm like, I'm going to build it. So I started going to all the machine shops in town 
and talking to the machinists and telling them what I wanted to do. And I found this one machinist, Mr. Harder, another mentor entering my life. And he's like, I'll teach you everything you need to know, but you have to help me out and you have to work for me. I want you to come in on Saturdays and, and work for me and I'll teach you some stuff that you need to know. And so that's what I did. I'd get up super early, which I didn't like doing, and I'd go into his machine shop and he would make me do all of the dirty work. I'd have to climb around under the lathe and clean the chips out and oil the, the gibs and the ways and haul metal around. I was just kind of slave labor, labor for him. In exchange, he would take me to the side towards the end of the day and he'd grab a scrap piece of metal and teach me how to weld or he'd, he'd show me how to chuck something up in the lathe and, and you know, bore holes or turn metal. And it was amazing. Uh, he was a funny character, um, and I've I've run into folks like this before, and uh, they 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 pretend to be grumpy when you do something wrong, but actually inside they're kind of happy about it. Um, and once I figured that out, I started feeling less bad about when I did things wrong. For instance, you know, tapping holes in metal is difficult, and then tapping holes in a lathe while it's spinning is even more difficult. So. You know, he would let me make mistakes, drill a hole the wrong size. He knew, and I could kind of see it on his face as I was getting ready to like tap a hole and I'd run the tap in, it would snap the tap off and he'd just like throw his hands up and just kind of make like some kind of like, oh, you just cost me money, ah. But yeah, and I'd catch him kind of like smiling, like, yep, you, you, you brat, like these are the lessons you need to learn. And I, I'm really, really grateful for him and, and out of that relationship, I was able to start building this chassis and welding it together. And partway through building this first chassis, my father came around. He's like, all right, you know, I'll help you finish this thing. And uh, I want you to be safe. And uh, that was amazing. You know, we, my father and I had this big divide and we came back together and, and we worked on this race car and I learned a ton. Uh, the first year that I went out to race, I was convinced I would be the fastest race car driver of all time. And I went out and I was like the absolute slowest. I, <laughs> racing cars does not come instantly. You have to practice, you have to have discipline. You have to make sure your car is set up right. The second year, I got another mentor in my life. This is another amazing situation. Uh, there were books and stuff on how to set up race cars. And I'd like bought these books and obsessed on them. And there was a phone number in the back, uh, a sales number. But I found if I called that number, I could actually, it was just a kind of a small scale business. I could actually reach the guy that wrote the book. And I was constantly asking him questions like, how do you do this? How do you get better? Da, 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 da. And uh, he's like, you know, if you just come out to Florida, I'll put you up for a week or two. And I'll teach you everything you need to know about racing. You know, pretty much quit calling me about all this stuff is what I think it was. And so I'm maybe like 17 years old at this time, maybe 18. And I jump on a Greyhound bus and I drive across the United States and spend a week with this gentleman and his, his wife. His name is Duke. And uh, what was interesting about that was that he taught me all the basics, like, you know, is how you adjust your shocks and cross weight and stuff in the car. And that was helpful. But he spent probably half the time or more talking about the psychology of racing and how to be a winner. And that was interesting. You know, sometimes being a winner is not about having the best car or being a great driver. It's about winning the hearts over of your fans or winning the hearts over of the, uh, um, the flagger at the track. And anything you can do to, to do that is helpful. And so... I came back and you know took that to heart, and uh, I became very competitive. Um, I learned these little tricks, things to get fans really excited about me. For instance, I would spend a lot of time in the audience, um, talking to fans and kids in the audience, and uh, I started winning so many trophies. I didn't care about these little plastic trophies anymore. So then I would just give the trophies to the first kid I saw when I went into the grandstands, and I became like this huge, like fan favorite. And of course, the flaggers. You know, the flaggers are there to make money by selling beer and nachos in the grandstands, so they want happy customers. And so and you get a little extra favoritism if you uh, are a, a favorite around the track. So it was super, super awesome. It was a great time in my life. Um, I started making so much money doing that, I dropped out of high school. Um, 
my father was a little concerned about that, but he now like was had these ambitions. He thought he was trying to connect me with these like pro racing uh, teams out in uh, North Carolina and stuff. He thought I was going to be like this uh, race car driver, a pro. Um, so I did that for four or five years, and it's not easy, you know, being a lady around the track. Uh, it's it's rough. It's it's a, a boys club, or it was in particular back then. So it was frustrating for me. I didn't like the dynamics of it. So one day I was visiting one of my high school friends, and as sitting in his man cave that he had built in his uh, garage, and in the his garage he had a 486 computer. So this is probably around 1995, and he's like. This computer would be fifteen hundred dollars, but I tricked a wholesaler into selling me the parts for wholesale prices, and it only cost me like seven hundred dollars to build it. And at this point, I had been building race cars and selling race cars and winning, you know, money. I had completely turned into an entrepreneur at this point. Plus, seeing my father be an entrepreneur helped too. I'm like, oh, that's some great margin, and boy, that'd be a lot better than racing cars every single weekend. I'm like, how about I just sell off all my racing stuff and let's open a computer store? This is 1995. Windows 95 isn't out yet, but AOL is a thing. And I could, I could see that you know, it was going to be big. So uh, we started a computer store. Um, things took off pretty well. Now, remember, I was this super edgy, gothy kid. Uh, every other word was a swear word out of my mouth. I had a chip on my shoulder, a bad attitude. And of course, first thing... We get the company off the ground, me and my business partner, we just are at each other's throats constantly. And he ends up booting me out of the business and I lost everything. I was so young and naive, I didn't know what to do. It was just like, he hired a lawyer, I was out. So I'm uh, in my apartment, I'm crying in my beer and I'm like, I don't know what to do. I call my father, like, what should I do? And he's like, well, you know, it was a good run you should go back to school and get a degree, uh, get your high school diploma, you know, get back on track in your life. I'm like, oh, okay. And so I sat there and think, thought about it, and then I got mad. I'm like, this guy can't do this to me. And this is gonna be a reoccurring theme with me. Um, like, I'm gonna put him out of business. And so I sold everything I had, I scraped every penny together, I broke the lease on my apartment, I got my deposit back, I found a little one shop barber sh or one chair barber shop um, just down the road from his store. Rented this thing dirt cheap. Uh, threw the barber chair out the back, which it disappeared at some point, you know, overnight. Um, managed to get the store kind of looking like a store. Started living in the back of it, but I had no money for the um, electronic components. So. It's like, well, I got to bootstrap this somehow. So I'd go to his dumpster. I'd get all of the colorful boxes and put them all over the wall so it looked like I had inventory. And the customer would wander in and be like, hey, I want that sound card. I'd be like, well, that one's committed. But if you give me the money for it, I can get you another one in three days. And um, that's how I bootstrapped the company. Uh, it was really robbing Peter to pay Paul constantly. And plus, I, I really hadn't learned how to relate to customers at this point. I was still this really edgy you know, kid. Um, had some really embarrassing moments. Like I didn't have enough money to pay for garbage service. So I was like taking my garbage and throwing in all the garbage cans around the neighborhood. And I got caught and the police came by and, and embarrassed me in front of one of my customers. And you know, it's... You know, I probably spent the first six months just starving to death in the back of the computer store, not really getting off the ground. But fortunately for me, across the street, another mentor entered my life. He was an insurance salesman. He was interested in computers. He came by at lunch oftentimes, and he would bring me food because he knew that I was just barely getting by. <laughs> and uh, he would say the nicest things to me. He's like, he would give me pep talks, and he, then he would give me some uh, guidance. He's like, you know, I noticed you interacting with that customer and you were swearing in front of them. That's not really a great way to be relatable. And I, I saw you, like, you know, the way you dress, you know, 
having super dark eyeliner and like gothy, that's not really relatable and torn up jeans and stuff like that. You, you know, you should kind of look the part. You got to look the part. And, you know, I admired him. He was successful. And I started to uh, adapt those things and introduce those into my life. And it, it was interesting. Like this was a, a weird moment in my life where I had my friends that we're still kind of living that lifestyle and I'm starting to diverge from them. And, you know, I've heard it as like the crab pot syndrome where crabs will pull you back in. And it, it felt like, like a lot like that. Like as I try to step forward, it kind of felt like I was always being pulled back into their gravity. And that was, that was rough and difficult. And I had to grow and get around that. Um, what's interesting is this whole time, even when I was racing cars and had that success, I really didn't like myself as a person, right? And, uh, but as I started to like get away from, you know, pretending to be this angsty person, I started to like feel better about myself and have more confidence. Then I started realizing like when I stopped being like a punk kid, you know, the world out there, you know, isn't going to treat you bad. They actually start treating you pretty nicely. And, and, uh, that was a, a really great transition. So. This computer store was awesome. It started to take off. Um, I, would, I wouldn't be undersold. I would actually lose money to make sure that I stole business from my, um, my ex-business partner. And it got to the point where every Wednesday we would get our shipment of parts. We'd have a line out the door and I start hiring people and we were breaking down pallets of parts and we're handing parts to people and building computers and I was hiring more people. It was so exciting. Moved into a bigger space. And we we're all like young kids at this this point. I'm in my 20s. I'm hiring lots of like computer enthusiasts. That was one of the things I learned is hire like people that are enthusiastic about the business. And uh, it was just explosive growth. Everyone was getting on AOL. Everyone was getting into games and 3D cards. And I started expanding, having more stores. And it really had this family vibe to it. And uh, uh, I just I thought this ride would never end. It was just getting ever bigger and bigger. And uh, so uh, at the same time, this allowed me to start to pick up some of my favorite things to do, building electronics. And now I had some money that I could do some more complicated things. So and this is where my story becomes a little nonlinear uh, because this this phase of things kind of overlaps into my next phase of uh, my career as well. But I started building things. I started building lots of things for fun, uh, like little circuit boards that did things like drove um, video displays or made sounds. I started like reverse engineering some of the old Commodore chipsets. I started going to events where I could show this stuff off and it was super fun. And uh, I, I started learning a lot about uh, serious engineering at this point. I met a couple mentors along the way. Um, got introduced to a lot of industry legends who um, turns out that, you know, in time we became friends with a, a bunch of these people. Got to meet Wozniak and some of the original Amiga folks like Dale Luck and some of the original Commodore folks and in, uh, in television folks. And a lot of these folks became my mentors and my sounding board as I was starting uh, to get more serious about electronics. But in the same time, I was uh, still riding high on the computer store. So there was no reason for me to like get too serious about all this electronics stuff until year 2000 comes along. And like business is going crazy up to year 2000. Everyone's replacing their computers because they're going to explode on day one of year 2000. And uh, day two in year 2000, sales dropped off like a brick. And in six months, my computer stores were hemorrhaging money like crazy. And uh, this is kind of a heartwarming part of my career. I, I, it was so rough at the time, but I think back now on it so fondly. You know, I was always very transparent with my personnel about what was going on. It's like, this is, does not look good. We're in trouble. We have to do things. And so people volunteer, voluntarily left the company. We started trying other things. We started uh, uh, selling cell phones and trying to do network gaming centers, just everything to keep the, the company alive. But it eventually got to the point where it was unsustainable. 
and I just couldn't take it emotionally anymore having to like see my friends leave you know one at a time and so I went to the managers of the various stores that I had and I said okay here's the deal I'm out um, I'll give you the inventory of the store if you want to run it and give it a go if you can manage to make it work fine uh, someday if you feel like it pay me back for the inventory but it's yours uh, we immediately closed down three of the stores. There wasn't enough interest. Two of the stores uh, continued on. And, uh, you know, the two stores went on for quite a while. One of them eventually folded. But um, I was just in Canby, Oregon recently and drove past. And one of the stores is still there. It's amazing. They they changed the name a little bit. Uh, they have a new logo, which was maybe a better, uh, you know, a good decision. But they made it. So kudos to them. It's amazing. They, uh, they made it through that bloodbath and survived up till today. So here, I, I, again, I go back to my father. I'm like, what should I do? My computer store has completely failed. And of course, he gives me like the, the safe thing to do. And he's like, all right, you're still young. Go back to school. Get a degree. You know, get your life back on track. And what do I do? I'm like, nah. I, I, I can do this, you know, on my own. So I started going to Silicon Valley and meeting people. And so I still had some money left over from the computer stores. And so I started flying to different conferences and I'd go in the conferences and I'd shake everybody's hands. And this is where I started meeting some of these people like Wozniak and some of these people that I idolized and got to know them and also met a lot of entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley. And, uh, uh, so I started interviewing for jobs like I want to do this and I had this I had this duffel bag full of circuit boards that would I bring to the interview and I'd like throw them out over the table like here's a board that does this this one has a processor I emulated an FPJ and this is that and I was just getting no after no after no no one would um, believe that a high school dropout could do it um, I started getting desperate for money. Um, I ran out of money. I couldn't fly down there as much. So I had to start taking a Greyhound bus from Portland where I lived at the time. And um, I had to uh, ride this Greyhound bus for 12 hours to go to these events. And if I had to do an interview, I had to drive it down. And you know, eventually I got a big break. And this gentleman, I met him at a trade show. He's like, you seem like the right type of person for my company. Can you come back in a week and interview? I'm like, yes, I can do that, um, which means another Greyhound bus ride. So I get on the Greyhound bus, I go down, I start the interview. They cut the interview off early after one or two you know, interviewees, interviewers. And I'm walking out of the building dejected, and I see him walking up the stairs. And he's like, where are you going? I was like, I don't know. They cut off the, the interview. And he's like, have you talked to so-and-so? And I'm like, no, I haven't talked to so-and-so. And he's like, come with me. And so he takes me back up. And he does a panel interview, which was super fun. And he just unilaterally hired me. And I took this super serious. I'm like, this is my chance. And I worked my ass off. And I did a good job. And from that, it led to other opportunities. And I, I started getting this reputation of like the person you go to that's going to work so hard, they're just going to get it done. I, it was very common for me to fall asleep in the office because I'd spent the entire night, you know, just trying to get this tough problem taken care of. In fact, I was taken advantage of it quite a bit in early in my career. Um, <laughs> some of these things I, uh, I did for like $12 an hour. You know, it was ridiculous. But it got, my, got me going and got my reputation going. Then I had a huge opportunity. Uh, a toy company contact me. They're like, we saw some of the stuff that you're doing. Uh, we've been trying to reverse engineer the Commodore 64 and put it all in a joystick so you can have all of your favorite Commodore 64 games in a little joystick you can plug into your TV. Uh, can you do an ASIC for us, a chip, a microchip? And I didn't know how to do a chip, but I was like, sure, no problem. And so I got to... Uh, <laughs> figure out how to design this chip without ever having doing, to do one before in a very short amount of time, like eight months. So we had a team of us. Uh, it was like about five of us. I was doing all the hardware, all the chips, all the prototypes. And then we had you know, about four people working on the software. Um, we were all Commodore fanatics. We loved it. Um, somehow, you know, more mentors entered my life. I found some chip design mentors. They helped me through the process. We got the chip done. We were late. We had to get it done for Christmas. 
So um, uh, the, the toy company put all this faith in me and they ran hundreds of thousands of chips without testing them through the foundry, millions of dollars. Uh, and then they sent them to China for assembly. I get this angry phone call after the chips get there, angry New Yorker screaming at me like, these things don't work, you need to fix it. You know, you cost us millions of dollars. I was like, oh crap, what do I do? And I was like, do I run to Mexico and hide? Um, but they threw me on a plane. I went to China. Uh, I got there. I found out that they had like re uh, redesigned my circuit board and threw away a bunch of the components, and it actually worked after all. Uh, when I was at the factory, um, we hadn't told the toy company that we had been adding extra stuff to this toy. We had gone outside the scope of the toy, and we had actually added extra games uh, to the, the system. And uh, I also added documentation, how you could open it up and download your own games to it and hack it. And the toy guys lost it on that. They were mad. They're like, you're never going to work with us again. You can't tell anyone about it. So I came back to the United States and I was talking to my friend who was like really savvy about doing blogs and things like that. And he said, it's like, well, you know, you've lost your chances in the toy industry. Do you want to just tell the world about it anyway? I'll make a fake blog that makes it look like a um, factory worker figured this out and um, have all this back history to make it look legit and you can get it out to the world. Uh, yeah, why not? I'm done for. And so he made this fake blog. He managed to get it on the front page of um, Slashdot, which was popular at the time. And this particular toy was being sold through QVC, sold to grandmas and grandpas. And it wasn't being promoted as like a retro throwback thing. It was more of a, a uh, get it for your grandkids type thing. And uh, it was on this home shopping network called QVC. And uh, when it launched, they sold out in a week. And QVC was calling up the toy company like, what's going on? Why are these things going around the world? Um, like 50% of them are going to you know, non-United States uh, addresses. And that was my first experience with viral marketing. Oh, geez, I'm running out of time. How many, can I go over? Uh, I better move. Anyway, this uh, toy became super popular, put me on the map, and uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, people still hack it today, which is amazing. Um, and I'm super proud of it, and people have me sign their device all the time. Uh, with that, all these news stories came out. Uh, it was super interesting. I had never had like worldwide press. You know, people were trying to contact me. People were trying to find me. They were calling my father. My friends were sending me screenshots of Google Analytics saying that I, um, I'm the number. I'm, I beat Santa Claus in search results on Google. Things like that. It was crazy. Um, made me very uncomfortable and at at the time. Uh, but that uh, launched my career into some pretty amazing things. Um, I worked on all kinds of things, like video compression chips. I worked on robots, telepresence um, devices, lots of toys. Got to work some of at NewTek, one of the companies that, you know, was like a dream company when I was a kid on the Amiga, and uh, really opened a lot of doors. There's so many stories I could tell about, you know, startup life. Um, in the meantime, I started a company. I mean, uh, my company, a YouTube channel where I started giving back. Um, so I tried to mentor virtually. And so I started doing hundreds and hundreds of videos about hardcore science and putting them up free on YouTube. This was like super early in the YouTube days. Um, had a lot of fun, got a lot of attention with that, met a lot of great people. Like in the upper left corner is Sylvia. Um, every year we take a picture together. She does this meta picture. We take pictures of each other um, when we go to events like Maker Fair. I got to show the world like things like um, how you could do uh, microchips in your garage or do electron microscopy. And, and because of this YouTube channel, a company called Valve Software started recruiting me very aggressively. Um, I was very happy at my current uh, gig that I was doing. Um, but they started showing up at various events like Maker Fair and saying like, hey, are you Jerry Ellsworth? We'd like to hire you. Um, I'd be at a pinball collecting event because I collect pinball machines and like someone would start playing pinball next to me like, hey, you're Jerry. Uh, we're from Valve. Do you want to come work with us? And I'm like, Valve, I don't know, a software company. And so Gabe Newell, the founder of the company, flew down to Portland and took me out to lunch. And he's like, hey, you know, 
this is serious. I really want you to come up and just meet the team. Will you just indulge me and come up for an afternoon? And I'm like, okay, I'll fly up for an afternoon. He promised me that it wasn't an interview. And that was a complete lie because as soon as I got there, they stuck me in a conference room, another panel interview, which I love them, but it was like a whole room of people like rapid fire, like, all right, we're going to make a game console. How do you do it? And I'd be like, oh, I'd go to this OEM or da -da 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 -da. like it, it, it was a really fun riffing session. And I swear, he must have done some kind of nose signal. And then everyone just got up out of the room and left. And he said, come with me, Jerry. And he took me down to the fourth floor of the, sky, uh, the building that they're in. And uh, he's like, this whole fourth floor is yours. Hire whoever you want. Bring all the best people in. This is what I want you to do. He's like, I want you to make a gaming system that brings everyone together in the family. So they're playing games together in the living room. He's like, does that sound interesting? Unlimited budget. I'm like, oh my goodness, I don't know. Like, you're springing this on me. And then they're like, well, can you stay overnight and think about it? And we'll talk to you about it more tomorrow. And I'm like, well, I didn't bring any toiletries. I didn't bring any clothes. And he's like, oh, we'll take care of that. And so they took me down to their swag room and started giving me, like, Valve t-shirts. And then they drove me by, like, stores so I could get, like, underwear and toothbrushes and stuff and I came back the next day wearing like a left for dead valve shirt or something it was hilarious and how could I say no to that and so that was amazing I put together this dream team we started researching everything about games we hooked people up to electrodes and we read their emotions we fed it into games and to see if we could make games more fun we read people's you know facial expressions with cameras and fed that into games and we made alternate controllers we did we we seeded all of the virtual reality stuff out there like oculus guys were coming through learning from us how to build virtual reality systems but that's where i got the augmented reality bug i invented an optical technique there trying to make an ar system that turned the optics inside out so you could use a game board to do um, augmented reality so you could open up this game board on your table and play a game and it was super popular people would come through and play on my AR system for hours and we had a whole team around it but Valve decided that they didn't want to go down this path um, their internal DNA was just too strong for hardcore games and so they proceeded with doing a VR system called HTC Vive um, based on a bunch of stuff that we all worked on uh, so I, I found myself outside of Valve with a bunch of the AR folks, and we started a company called Cast AR. Uh, and I actually bought the technology from Gabe Newell. Uh, it was kind of funny, the day that I went to talk to him after um, being let go, I'm like, first I was going to go chew him out for it, but that didn't last. You know, I got emotional about 30 seconds into it. I'm like, oh, I can't believe you're killing my project. It's so good. It does exactly what you say. You can play AR on the table and it brings people together and you know the best thing I ever said during that meeting was like you should just sell it to me and he said sure and you know it took a lot of lawyers and stuff but we ended up buying the technology for a hundred dollars and starting this company and so Rick and I and some of the other folks we spent like six months bootstrapping this company and we got prototypes going they were kind of rough at first and they got better and better and uh, we got the company off the ground and uh Things were looking really good. Um, I started making a bunch of mistakes at this point. Um, I was scared. I didn't know how to run a venture-backed company. I'd never done it before. I'd never been a CEO before. So I started outsourcing those tasks, all the management of the company, which was a huge mistake. You know, the visionary of the company should never hand the keys over to somebody else. And I learned the hard way. And then we raised a bunch of money. Virtual reality was hot. Augmented reality was hot. Andy Rubin from uh, Google came in and just gave us $15 million and um, overfunded the company. And that's when things started really going sideways with it. We lost focus on tabletop gaming. We started uh, being pushed in all these different directions, like medical imaging and military and just all these crazy things instead of staying focused. And then came the constant stream of celebrity um, executives and executives out of big companies that just got installed into my company. I found myself for the last like year and a half of the company just kind of sitting in the corner. They didn't want anything to do with my input and they were just running the, the company. And sure enough, the, the company creates a huge crater in the ground. Uh, they 
they burn through all the money, you know, doing all kinds of crazy things like paying expensive uh, wages to the executives and bringing in firms to like, you know, change the color of the glasses and, and kind of unnecessary stuff instead of just shipping the first product. And it was really sad. I was devastated. And I'm sitting in the office by myself after laying off about 70 people. Um, and I'm sitting in the office and out of the blue, I get a phone call from Nolan Bushnell, the founder of Atari. I maybe met him once. I didn't even know he knew who I was. And somehow he had found my phone number and he's like, Jerry, I'm a big fan. I've been watching you for years. I love what you're doing. This is going to be a game changer. You know, it's sad. And I could see with all these executives coming in and you losing control that this was not going to end well. He's like, I don't know exactly how to tell you to fix this, but I just want to tell you, if you want this to happen, there's a way. Just go figure it out. And so I went to all my mentors and, and, and everyone. I started asking them, like, can I make this work somehow? It's such a great product. And I started working closely with my mentors and they told me like, you know, you can actually buy all this technology back at the, after the end of the company, it'll just go up for auction. And so a group of us got together and that's what we did. We bought the technology and uh, we started bootstrapping the company again, but this time with extreme focus. And we spent months and months, we didn't even you know, start hiring people or try to raise money. We just wanted to make sure we had charted a very clear course of how we were going to be successful. And in the, mean that, in the meantime, to bootstrap the company, I got an, a call and an opportunity that was a lifelong dream. I mean, I'm a child of the 80s, the space shuttle, Haley's Comet. Like, I love space. And so a friend of mine called me up and he's like, hey, I'm a CEO of this stealthy space company, um, I want you to come up and design computers for us. And I'm like, no, 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 I can't do that. I'm, I'm bootstrapping my company. And he's like, you're the only guy, the only person I know that can come th through and like get this problem solved for us. I'm like, he's like, please come up and just visit me. And so he was, I'm mean, living in Silicon Valley at the time, and he's up in Alameda, which is a little north of um, the center of Silicon Valley go onto this naval base, I walk in the door and I see this rocket laying horizontally on the, in this facility. I'm like, holy cow, that thing's so cool. And he's leading me around the, uh, the facility and he's like, yeah, the guy that was doing our flight computers left, they're not done, they're, we don't think they're even remotely close, like, you need to save us. I'm like, I can't, I can't, I'm starting my company. He's like, well, here, come take a look at this. And so in this facility, it was an old jet engine testing facility. They actually had these giant rocket motors set up in these test cells. And he's like, do you want to push the fire button? Like, yes. So they count down, it lets me push the fire button. And the fire starts shooting out of this, this jet engine, I mean, this rocket engine and the ground shaking. And I'm like, ah, damn it, ah. It's like, I, I have to get the company going in like five months, so I'll help you, but it's gotta be done in, in this amount of time. He's like, I'll take it. And so, wow, it was like an amazing compressed timeline, but um, I worked with a really tiny team, mostly software folks. We built the flight computers and the telemetry system. I did all the hardware on it, um, on the, uh, the computers, all the radios, and we, we got it going and I uh, took it up to Alaska and, and, and launched it. And then I, I was like, like, I'm done here. Uh, but this is what it did the first uh, two times that they launched it. Happy to say it was never a software or you know, electrical problem. But uh, eventually they did get it. To get, oh, wait, I put this picture in. You got to see this. This is what happens to a flight computer when it's ejected from a rocket that it has an unscheduled disassembly. Uh, this was picked up like a mile away from the rocket and literally all the chips had fallen off of the part off the board and the, uh, the, the board is massively warped. It's incredible. But they did it. Uh, rocket three has a little my DNA in it and they made it to space. So wow, dream come true. 
I don't think I would ever do that again. It's so hard to work with the FAA and um, the launch facilities. But this gave me enough time and enough time for our team to work. And we got Tilt 5 off the ground. A lot of people ask us what the name Tilt 5 stands for, and we can never tell you. Um, this partly is an inside joke because at my previous company, Cast AR, the uh, executives wanted to rename the company about five times, and they paid a lot of money to rename it. And so we just chose a name that makes us laugh, and we don't care what people think. I'm the CEO this time. I'm driving the vision of the company. Our goal is to bring people together in the living room, sound familiar, playing games, grandma, grandpa, down to the grandkids. Our system is the AR glasses that you slip on. They have a massive field of view. So when you flip open the game board, this magical world just springs out in front of you. Um, it allows multiple players to play together. You can play board games and you can play traditional video games. So if you've been hungry to play video games together, you, know, you don't have to play multiplayer games apart anymore. You can play it together on our system and you can look across the table at your friends as you're playing the game. It's magical. This time we're super focused. Games, games, games. And the other thing I learned from my previous startup was we were way too focused on the technology. We were so excited about the plastic and the sensors and the, the images and things like that. And we forgot that we have to go get a lot of games on the system. And so, you know, most of our work is actually going out and working with third-party developers to have dozens and dozens of games and just a constant flow of games of all types. And so, it's so delightful for me, like three years after such a traumatic event that we're now building these glasses and they're going out to real users and developers and we get to play test all these games. And there's just this constant stream of RTSs and board games and action games and puzzle games, single player, multiplayer. It's like a dream control that true. This is like, this is the thing I dreamed about, you know, since the, early 80s when I saw Star Wars and, and Hollow Chess, or the Star Wars Chess. So anyway, I know I've gone over my time. I should uh, probably put a pin in it here. Um, feel free to visit um, tilt5.com. And also, all of our development at Tilt 5 is on Linux. Um, our glasses also run on Linux. Um, that's the, everything gets tested on Linux first. So uh, this audience is probably going to be pretty happy about that. I don't know if we have time for questions. I went a little over. Thank you very much, Jerry. You did Thank you. indeed go, go a bit over time, but uh, the audience here was very vocal that you should go over. So uh, we <laughs> should stop, stop it, if it even, even if we wanted to. And also, judging by your whole story, would really a clock stop you? <laughs> no, no, that's, that is, uh, you know, that's my whole story, right? It's like, people tell me I can't do something, like I can't race cars. I mean, the number of people told me when I was like 16 year old, years old, you can't race cars, that just emboldens me to do it. Or even with Cast AR, when it failed, like, I got so much negative press, like, she's a loser, she failed, she couldn't do it. It was just like, and then I just had this catalyst of like this industry legend saying, you can do it. And that's like, yeah, I can do this. And, you know, that kind of energy and having those mentors around you to support you, you know, is how you get through the low points. Yeah. yeah. In fact, one of the, one of the question was not a question was like uh, saying, not a question, just really shared the tape, really, really, really loved your talk. Thank you. And that's more or less the general mood from the. Thank you. But we have some questions, so maybe we can go at least with one or two. Let's see. Oh, that'd be awesome. I appreciate it. Uh, Marco is asking, uh, today electronics are more hostile to tinkering. On the other hand, online resources to learn are awesome. Do you think today, today environment is more or less stimulating for young people to tinker? I would have died to have the World Wide Web and all these resources. I can't even imagine how much further I could have gone in my career if I would have had those resources. I am so envious about, you know, a kid that's 12 year old, years old today that can get online and start learning about whatever science and technology or art that they want to. 
you know, back in my day, like to, to get a data sheet for a chip, I would have to get on the phone and pretend that I was a secretary for an engineer because that's all I could pass off as. And then I would try to convince them we were a real company and have them try to sh try to get them to ship <laughs> ship me a data sheet or a sample part to this like podunk little town out in the middle of nowhere. And it, sometimes it worked and most of the time it didn't. Now you can just like, yeah, all these resources, it's great. Yeah, it's totally, totally different. Um, there is another question which I think you kind of answered, but just to be sure. Uh, will we, we be able to get the tilt five losses and once uh, working with Linux? Will we have an API to develop with it? All right, my co-founder always wants me to um, qualify this. So there's so many variants of Linux. So, you know, it has to kind of fit with what we're um, the current um, version of Linux we're using in the office. So most of our development, most of the folks are using Ubuntu 20. Um, I've used it on the latest drop of uh, KDE, so that's good news. Um, so I suspect, you know, it's those two are so close. Uh, but, you know, I'm so impressed with the, the UI. You know, I'm a, what they call an appliance user, right? I'm not a hardcore uh, Linux user. Although I have a lot of stories about, I actually did the configurations for this rocket and Linux on that. And I have like an entire, I could do an hour about uh, interesting Linux and rocketry uh, stuff, but uh, that's for another time. Um, I do appreciate since like half my tools are on Windows, I just have to use them on Windows that the KDE environment feels so familiar to me. It's, I, I like it better than, uh, you know, just the default Ubuntu installs. And that kind of answer also the other question, which was, how are you finding the KDE Plasma desktop and what distro um, are you running? So well, I guess. It was the latest and greatest. Let's see uh, about, uh, let's see. It is Plasma 5.21.4. Okay. Almost. I think, think that's the latest almost. and greatest. Almost the latest, but uh, that's really a matter of a few days. So that's kind of still the, the latest from the practical point of view. So that, that's well, fine. Here on my workbench, I actually hooked it up to all my ham radio gear. I'm a ham radio operator. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, using uh, Linux and ham radio is not for the faint of heart, but um, I did get everything working on Linux. And so I'm Windows free now on my ham radio configuration. So it's pretty cool. I can control my radios from the, the um, desktop. That's very, very nice to hear. I know that there are a lot of um, radio projects, so that's good that they are working properly. OK, there are no other questions. So I guess we are at the end of the talk. It was so fun. I really, really appreciate letting me come and tell my long, windy story. I hope people didn't get too bored. Absolutely oh, no. not. <laughs> they were ready to <laughs> stay or. <laughs> Yeah, but the chat is already uh, already uh, applauding and uh, happy. When you said that you have a side story about Linux in rackets that could take another hour, I, I'm sure everyone was waiting for that to start I, that. I, I should probably wait until um, Astra, that's the name of the rocket company, is uh, taken over and uh, SpaceX is no longer and there's no sensitive information. But it, it was super interesting. Uh, device trees the first time i've had to do that because we were making custom hardware it's like ooh, fun times story for next time perhaps yes yes anytime you want me i'll uh, i'll be here okay thank you again very much jerry thank you luigi for handling the questions and uh, i guess this is the end of our uh of our uh, track here so i'll do some uh, housekeeping, I guess, to announce what's coming up uh, in the following days.